Hi guys, how are you doing? Thank you. Did great, thanks. Did you enjoy all the beautiful data from the previous talks? All the different techniques? Yes? Because I'm not going to show any data whatsoever. Okay. Sure, sure. I'm gonna continue anyway. Okay. So, but the point is that my, my, my goal is to convince you that something like interferometry is actually something that is great, thanks. Uh, importance, in particular, if you go the long run, if you think about the marathon and you would like to characterize terrestrial exoplanets. So my goal is that to convince you, nulling interferometry is nothing to be afraid about. It's something useful and powerful for the long term. Okay? It does work. All right, quiz. What is interferometry? It's totally uncomfortable now, right? Yes, please, thank you. I know, I know, go. You combine multiple mirrors to act as one mirror. Anyone else? Everyone happy with the answer? Yes, please. Black holes. <laughs> yeah, image of black, okay. How could a black hole be, okay, fine. So, great. So if you believe Wikipedia, interferometry is a technique which uses the interference of superimposed waves to extract information. That sounds not too bad. And I actually would agree with the statement. And here's one way, and this goes exactly what you were describing, uh, how we think about interferometry, at least one kind of interferometry uh, for astronomical purposes. So if you have uh, a star somewhere here, and you have two telescopes and the telescopes look at the same star, you have the incoming wavefront, and then you combine the light from the star somewhere here. If you wanna do this, you have to make sure that the path difference of the incoming wave, so here it takes longer for the waves to reach this telescope. This has to be compensated somewhere down here so that you overlay the, uh, the, the waves coherently and you see here these interferometric fringes. So keep this picture in mind because we will look at a modified version of this, of this later on. Okay. Good. Ah, uh, no, 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 wait, wait. Oh, good. That's okay. No, okay. <laughs> Quiz. What is the motivation to use optical nulling interferometry in exoplanet science? Yes, thank you. To hide the stellar light, yes. And? Okay, um, very good. So the goal is to directly detect photons from the exoplanets, in particular non-transiting ones. So basically, if you do something which we call optical nonlinear interferometry, you should have access to the planets directly and look into the atmospheric properties but for all kinds of planets. And I highlighted here the words optical nulling interferometry because this is really the topic of the coming 20 minutes. So I'm not talking about radio astronomy. I'm not talking about sparse aperture masking. I'm not even talking about the fantastic science that gravity did. Uh, Jason showed this very beautiful result, you know, from the gravity uh, instrument at the VLTI. So this is all fantastic, but this is what we have to work out in the coming years and really get, get to work for the, for the future. So if you want to detect photons directly from a planet, and this ties very nicely to Jason's talk, uh, the first talk in the morning, you have to fulfill three criteria. So you have to have high spatial resolution because planet and star are very close together. You have to have high contrast performance because the planet is orders of magnitude fainter than the star. And you need to have high sensitivity because planets tend to be intrinsically faint. So let me show some of this uh, in some more detail. If you want to put some numbers for the spatial resolution, if you think about a single dish telescope, you have a Rayleigh criterion that tells you that the spatial resolution is 1.2 lambda over D. And now you can translate this into, you know, sort of useful physical units, for instance, in AU as a certain separation for your favorite telescopes. And you can see that I'm European. So I have D equals 8.2 for the VLT and have D equals 90, uh, 39 for the upcoming ESO ELT. And I put here 11 micron as wavelength. And this also tells you what I'm very much concerned about. These are the small rocky planets, the temperate ones, because 11 micron, this is where the Earth emission peaks, the intrinsic thermal emission. So if you look closely at these numbers, it tells you that with the current telescopes, we cannot reach separations of order one Earth uh, uh, orbital period uh, around a sun-like star, even 
at a distance of only 10 parsec. It gets a little bit better, of course, if you increase the aperture size, uh, go to the ELTs, and if you change the wavelengths to shorter wavelengths, of course, this helps you a lot. Still, the volume you're probing for plants is still somewhat limited, and this is going to be important. If you think about contrast, here's one way of thinking about this. So you have fewer cartoons of solar system planets, Mars, Earth, Venus, and Jupiter, and you have fewer our sun, all represented by black bodies. And for the sake of it, we put a hot Jupiter in our solar system that, as we all know, don't have. And you do the same on the right-hand side, where instead of the sun, you put an M star, because M stars are also a repeating topic of this workshop so far. And you have the same solar system planets down here. You can already see that all the planets have two bumps in their spectra. And this is the reflected light part. And this is the intrinsic thermal emission. So depending on the size of the planet and its separation, hence its intrinsic temperature, these two bumps will look different. And I was already mentioning that there are certain wavelengths ranges where our home planet Earth is the brightest. And this happens to be around 10, 11 microns. So this is why I put the 11 microns on the, on the previous slide. Now, if you look a little bit closer, you can try to estimate what the contrast is that you have to overcome in order to directly detect the signal of the planet next to the star. And it happens to be of order 10 to the 10 in reflected light for an Earth-Sun system. This reduces to 10 to the 7 in thermal emission. And if you make the star smaller, this gets easier by, let's say, roughly two orders of magnitude. Then you say, all right, that's great. So let's do the 10 micron experiment, right? This is easier. So why should I bother to do this here if I can do this? Remember the first criterion, the spatial resolution? Going from 0.5 micron to 10 micron or 11, that's a factor of 20 in spatial resolution. So basically you have to make your telescope 20 times larger and that's not gonna happen, right? Good, so you start seeing the complexity of, of, of this endeavor here. Finally, high sensitivity. Um, don't worry so much about all the, uh, the lines up here. We will come back to this later. Just look at the line that is called planet or labeled planet. This is down here, the red one. So this is an emission spectrum again of, of, of an Earth-like planet. And now please look at the y-axis. This is photons per second per square meter, square meter per micron. This is of order 0.1. So this is the number of photons you expect from an Earth-like planet at 10 parsec separation or distance. Again, that's not very far away. It's somewhat far away, but not very far away. So basically, if you measure a photon from an Earth-like planet at 10 parsec, you can greet all of them individually. It's nice, but it's also challenging, right? If you want to get a spectrum and analyze the atmospheric, atmospheric composition. So let's spend a couple of minutes trying to understand how knowledge interferometry works. So you remember maybe one of the first uh, slides I showed where you had a more elaborate cartoon. So this is now more simplified. You still have a star. You still have two telescopes. They're separated by the B, uh, baseline B. And now the wave is coming in. And for, uh, to make it more simple, now it's perfectly edge on. So you don't have to worry about the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the day lines here to compensate the past difference. So if you do this, and if you combine the light from the star, the light will be perfectly uh, will be interfering perfectly constructively at exactly the position of, of the star in the central of your, of your aperture, where you combine it. Now, if you're slightly offset, then you will have destructive interference, positive interference, destructive interference, positive interference again. So you can think of it as projecting this transmission map onto the plane of the sky. As long as the star is perfectly in the center, light from the star will be transmitted. And you already see here like another Blue, blue dot, and this is going to be our planet. So this planet, unfortunately, sits at the location when the light goes through the system, it will not interfere positively or constructively, but destructively. So you would not see any light from the planet in this case. So this you would like to switch, right? You don't want to see the star, you would like to see the planet and not the star. So what you're going to do is very simple. You just, ah, one more thing that's important to keep in mind. So B determines the spatial resolution. So this separation here is lambda over two times the baseline. So, and if you can make this baseline arbitrary long, in principle, you can have arbitrary long spatial, uh, spatial resolutions or big, large, large spatial resolutions. So this is, this is actually one of the powerful things of this. Now, what you're gonna do is you just add a pi phase shift, an achromatic pi phase shift across all wavelengths you're interested in, in one of the arms. So what happens now, you shift the bright fringe that was on the star first, you move this star on a destructive fringe. And this is the nulling. So you null out the star by making sure that in one of the arms, you add half of everything's phase shift before you combine the light of the, uh, of the two telescopes. So now you null the star 
And magically, in this case, of course, by construction, you see that the planet is at a bright fringe. So it can now detect photons from the planet. This is the fundamental principle of, of uh, nulling, nulling interferometry. So let's take this uh, to, to a specific example. So let's take it an Earth Sun system, again, at 10 parsec at 10 micron. So if you have two apertures that are separated by 10 meters, you will null the star. And if you had this, the Earth sitting here, you would actually be able to see the, uh, the signal of the planet. Now you can say, how do we know where the planet is? So there's a trick you can play. And what you're going to do is, it's already indicated here by this little circle, you're going to rotate this array. You're going to rotate these two, these two apertures. And by this, the planet will make this movement through this tr uh, projected transmission map. And in the end of the day, you're going to have a modulated signal where the planet goes through transmission, non-transmission, transmission, non-transmission. Non and this is actually a measurement. So we have a time-resolved flux measurement of a planet. You measure how the photon rate from the planet changes as you rotate your array. This is how your signal is, is, uh, is actually taken. For comparison, if you have a 10 meter single dish um, telescope, you will not be able to see the planet because it's hidden under the PSF of, the, uh, of, your, of your instrument. So this is why it makes a huge difference if you have a 10 meter uh, interferometer or a 10 meter single aperture. And what you maybe want to do, if you can um, uh, play as, as much as you want or uh, your total freedom, you would probably like to add more of these. So instead of having two, you're going to have two times two. Let's do the same. But then you combine the construct the destructive output of the two to again overlay. And I'm going to show one more in one more plot um, the, how, how this works. So you create this checker pattern. And if you look carefully now, what you actually do is you have here this transmission map goes from perfect transmission one to zero, and you have from one to minus one because you do a subtraction between the two destructive outputs from the two. And this is why you can, in principle, have sort of negative counts. Of course, there's still positive photons, but you can sort of invert it into a negative measurement. And now if the planet is uh, located here and you rotate your array, you will see that this modulation has a different shape now. And this modulation turns out to be important because depending how you modulate, it's easier to dig out the faint signal of the planet in the remaining noise of, of the star and other things that you may have in the system. So here's a little bit more clearly how it works. So you have two times these two, uh, two aperture interferometers. You have two destructive outputs, these ones here. And you combine them again with a pi half, another phase shift to have the two destructive outputs here that you do a subtraction in order to arrive at this, at this transmission map here. Now, this pi half phase shift it turns out to be important because if you're very careful, you can see that this pattern is actually not point symmetric, but is sort of anti-point symmetric. So we have a bright fringe here and a dark fringe here, a bright fringe here and a dark fringe there. So what this means is that if you had a point symmetric source, for instance, an exozodiacal disk or bright local zodi background, they would cancel out because in one part it comes through and the other one doesn't come through. So by introducing this additional phase shift, you're going to get rid of all the light, not only from the star, but also extended emission that you don't want to have while measuring the signal. So this is why adding, instead of only having two, doing four, and then adding this pi, uh, pi half shift is actually important. All right. Now you can have many, many more transmission maps, right? If you, we had four so far, there's people who look with three, you can do five, you can do six. There's many, many ways. We not go through this here in detail, but it depends on the question you're after. It depends on the reliability of your system. Um, you can see here that these transmission map have, have maps have very different characteristics. So depending on where your planets are that you're mostly interested in, you may want to favor either of these, of these architectures. And this is actually something very important if you think about future missions, you would like to understand what architecture is the most reliable, the most robust, giving you the most science output. So you may have not heard about null interferometry so far so much, but it has been used already in the past. And I think one very fantastic output was the result from the so-called host survey. And this is at the Large Bonnecta Telescope Interferometer, where they used a 10 micron nulling instrument to measure the level of exozody disks around nearby stars. And that turns out to be a very critical experiment because if you wanna build multi-billion dollar Euro Swiss franc missions, 
we would like to understand the level of exozotis that you can expect. So this turns out to be a super critical experiment that at least statistically, we now have an understanding how broad exozoti disks are. And apparently they do not pose a real threat to these future missions. And yet probably would like to learn still a little bit more, maybe do a systematic survey. But that was based on a nuller, on a ground-based telescope in the mid-infrared. So going to the future. So on the ground, there's an instrument at the VLT, at the VLTI, which is called NOT. So the VLT, you can use as an interferometer. You can actually combine the light from all the UT telescopes, all these four big ones. And then we also have these small Pac-Man telescopes here, the ATs, these ones here. And you can move them around to create several baselines. And you combine all the light down here in this one, in this uh, laboratory on the mountain. And so far, um, there was not, um, we didn't have a nulling, in, nulling instrument at the VLTI, but there's one now which is called NOT that will do nulling at four microns. So on the mid-infrared, and NOT is part of a more complex instrument suit that's going to do many, many different interferometry applications. It's going to be a visitor instrument or visitor instrument suit, hopefully being operational in a few years from now. And there's a recent paper out that already tells us about the complexity of this endeavor and also tells us how well you can, well, well they hope to calibrate the system to understand how well uh, NOT can actually perform in terms of high contrast performance. The goal is to go closer to the star with existing facilities. You've seen this image in one way, in a similar form from Jason this morning. So here is now the snow line in the system. Wow, it's really bad here with my left hand. So the snow line, and you can see, see here Jupiter's orbit. And what you would like to do is you would like to get in here because many of the planets that we have found are beyond the snow line. And you would sort of expect most of the gas giants to be within the snow line. So let's do an experiment and search for planets in the snow line. And this is something that NOT could do. So it's going to look for young gas giants in the gaps of transition disks and other young gas giants around nearby young stars. Finally, in space, there is hopefully something that's called the Large Interferometer for Exoplanets for short life in the, in, in the future. And the idea here is that you do four spacecraft in space that combine the light and the beam combined on spacecraft. And they all look at the same star's planet system and combine the light to characterize planets in the thermal infrared. You can see here the baselines, it's of order 10 to 100 meters. They should be flexible to make sure you optimize your observations for each individual star. And the goal would be to take spectra, again, in the mid-infrared between maybe four and 80 microns with a certain spectral resolution to analyze the atmospheric composition of, of these planets. This is not a new idea. There are some people in the room who are very familiar with these mission concepts. They were called TPFI and, and the, on the on NASA side and was called Darwin on the European side. This is 20 years ago. And the idea to do knowledge for exoplanet science, that's even older than I am. And they will tell you something. So it's 1978. Bracewell wrote a paper in Nature detecting non-solar planets by spinning infrared interferometer. It's kind of sad that we're still talking about this conceptually, you know, this great idea has been around for a long time. But ever since these studies were, were done and then those missions were, were not implemented, I think we learned a ton about exoplanets as we just seen this morning and already yesterday. And we also made tremendous progress in technologies that I think it's really worth revisiting this, this approach. So the motivation for the wavelength range for the life mission is directly here. So it's the thermal emission of the plants that we're interested in. You see here the rocky plants in our solar system, Earth, Venus, and Mars, and you can see all the spectral features that they have. They are, their emission peaks around 10, 11 microns, and you're gonna have a great handle on the major atmospheric constituents, CO2, for instance, and water, but also very importantly, you have biosignatures, at least in the Earth atmosphere, nitrous oxide, uh, ozone as a photochemical byproduct of oxygen, and you also have methane bands. So this is sort of the motivation for the, for the wavelengths range. And the great thing is you can also reconstruct images. If you don't get an image directly from the modulated signal, you can infer where the planets should have been, and then you can make a family portray of our solar system, if it were a 10 parsec around a sun-like star. And uh, you may wonder where Mars is. Mars is right there, but it's small and it's cold. So even from space, it's difficult to see. But this shows you in principle that you can also do multi-planet systems with, with nulling interferometry because each planet has a different modulated signal. And this you can disentangle. The great thing if, is if you go to mid-infrared and you're interested in biosignatures, you have an advantage because 
there's more signatures that you can look for. In reflected light, you can do many fantastic great things, but most molecules we might be interested in, the vibrations, the rotations, they have signatures in the mid-infrared. And here's just a collection, and I think Eddie's also going to be talking about um, um, uh, biosignatures, I think on Friday, that many of the signatures that could indicate the existence of a biosphere have strong features of everything's ranges that a mission like life would actually cover. And I think this is a good justification to really look into this in some more detail. Now, if you ask what a mission like life could, could detect, this is one way of looking at it. So if you were to do a search around st plant for plants around stars within 20 parsec, you end up with numbers that are comparable to the studies that were done for Habax or Louvoir in reflected light. A few hundred, 200, 300, doesn't really matter. It's comparable. But the great thing is you can also then map this parameter space here in a, in a graph that shows you the insulation that the plant receives versus the size of the planet. And for reference, we have Earth and Venus here. This is Mars and Mercury. And you have fear and contours that shows you the primary discovery space of the life mission. So it uh, perfectly overlaps with uh, Earth and Venus. And you can see all these blue dots. These blue dots are known planets within 10 parsec. You may not have heard about them because they're not transiting. But a mission like life can take a picture of them. You can directly detect them because we know where they are. And because of the long baselines, you have the spatial resolution to detect the signals. So you don't only have to research and wait to find planets, you have a target list to characterize planets right away from day one, basically. Okay, so if this was every, so easy, why haven't we done it, right? Well, there are challenges, obviously. So let me give you one slide with challenges. <laughs> So I showed this plot already at the beginning, right? So you may remember that this is the faint signal of the planet. And I told you, please forget the other lines for a minute. Now let's look at the other lines. So this is the signal of the star. This is the photo noise of the star. This is the signal of the exozoity disk that we uh, modulated, uh, modeled. This is the local zodi. So many sources are much brighter than the signal of the planet. So you have to use this modulation to dig out the faint signal in the photo noise sea or the ocean of photo noise from all these other sources. Very similar to what Mattia was just discussing. Your signal is much fainter than the photons, but you're still ways to figure it out because of the modulation. So that's something you really have to, uh, you have to worry about that you make sure that you understand the system well enough in order to find those, those faint signals. And the other one, you can now ask the question, how well do you have to control the beams that you want to combine? Is it you know, just a centimeter or is it a meter accuracy? Turns out to be, of course, much, much harder. And this is a little bit of a complicated plot. Let me walk you through it. The, this tells you the OPD, the optical path difference, or how well you have to control the phase in RMS in nanometers. And this tells you the relative amplitude error that you can expect for differences between two beams. They should be perfectly the same. Of course, they are not. So you have to make sure you get them as close as possible in phase and in amplitude. And this line here, this red line, that's where it says one, this tells you where the instrumental noise, if you don't do it well, equals the astrophysical noise terms from all these things on the left-hand side. So, and this gives you a hint that you would, would like to control the phase of order one nanometer RMS, and maybe also the amplitude of order, you know, one 1% 1 or so RMS. And this is difficult. And this is one of the reasons why we still have to find solutions, technical solutions to get this to work. Okay, so the good thing is that this topic has been identified on the European side of, uh, of, of the ocean as a potential topic for a future L-class mission. This does not mean it's gonna fly, but this means it's on the books of ESA and their senior report had some very, very nice and strong statements. So atmospheres of tempered exoplanets in the mid-infrared mid should be a top priority for ESA. It would be an outstanding breakthrough that could lead to another paradigm shifting discovery if you were to detect habitable planets and biosignatures. So this is what we're gonna use for as long as we can and show it to ESA and say, look, you said this, right? So let's, let's, look, let's look into this, right? Don't, don't, don't be too quick and disregard it, it's great. Please share this message with all, you, you know, all your friends and families, that's, that, that's gonna be important politically. And then you can do the big picture. And maybe this is sort of a little semi summary from what we've been discussing this morning, already hinting towards the discussion on Friday with the future missions. So if you're now interested in understanding exo Earth, you have to have a, a holistically, you have to have different instruments, telescopes combined. It's not a competition. It's really the synergies that we have to understand and leverage. And some of the synergies between high-risk and low-risk were just presented in Matteo's work, right? So this is something we have to keep in mind going forward if you're interested in the small planets. 
and direct detection will be crucial. So if you now talk about the direct detection of small planets, you have reflected light and thermal emission, and you also may want to may want to um, do the, the differentiate between M star planets and solar type star planets because they pose different challenges. And if you now try to fill this two by two metrics, you're going to find that the M stars are in reflected light. The plans around the M stars and reflected that. That's probably the ELT territory because of the increased spatial resolution and the not so stringent contrast that you have. You can do this from the ground, hopefully. Mattia was alluding to this. We don't have the full answer yet, but this is certainly the territory for the, for the ELTs. Then the reflected light for solar type stars, this is the territory of the Habitable Worlds Observatory. No one can beat this mission, probably in terms of contrast. You have to go to space for the 10 to the 10 I was mentioning, you have to go to space. And uh, unfortunately, you don't have the spatial resolution to do the M star planets. And for thermal emission in the long run, there's just no other answer than emission like life. The problem even with the ELT from the ground is we have so much thermal emission around us that we cannot beat down the thermal background noise that we have when observing from the ground to see the small faint planets in the sky. So this is why we have to go to space. Take away, null interferometry is a high spatial resolution, high contrast technique that allows for the direct detection of exoplanets. It's well suited at mid infrared wavelengths where single apertures cannot do it. And uh, recent successes include the host survey for the exosolid dust disk. And in the future, instruments like NOT will pave the way for future space missions that I believe at the moment is the most promising approach for the direct characterization of uh, exo Earth in the mid infrared. Happy to take questions. From the audience. I'm Jay Gugi, University of Maryland. Um, thank you for your great talk. Um, it's because the interference pattern scales with your wavelength, presumably the modulated signal is also wavelength dependent. Is that just a foible or is there something you can uh, useful information we can get out of that? Yeah, that's a very good point. So in of indeed, this this transmission map that I was showing that depends on the wavelength. So you have to ask the question, what is the wavelength range you're mostly interested in? And then you can optimize the configuration such that you're most sensitive to this part of the parameter space or of the, of the, of the wavelength range. So for the search phase that I was briefly describing, you would probably um, orient or, or, or configure your, your architecture so that you're most sensitive to planets in the habitable zone around 10, 50 micron wavelengths, because this is where most of the flux is, so you get most of the detections there. For characterization, it would depend what molecules you're mostly interested in. Uh, nice job, Sasha. Uh, so what would you say the biggest technological challenges or, or what changed in the past 20 years since TPF and Darwin that makes this more feasible now compared to 20 years ago? And what technology needs to be developed to make this work? Yeah, this is, a, of course, a critical question. I don't have a comprehensive answer here. We're going to do a, a study, uh, um, a concept study for the full, full mission, hopefully next year, together with industry partners, to really come up with a tech gap list that we need to have very quickly. For the time being, uh, we are investing in demonstrating the fundamental measuring principles, so null and interferometry in the lab. This has been done in the past, in particular, just you know, a few kilometers, oh, sorry, a few miles from here in JPL. There were gigantic test beds that demonstrated that you can do this flux suppression very accurately. The challenge there was that it was not done with realistic flux levels. That was not the goal. So what I mean by this is that it were done in ambient conditions with high power, high power lasers. And then it's somewhat easy to get rid of the photons. If you have many photons, getting rid of some is easy. So we're now doing the next step that was recommended actually shortly after these, uh, these mission concepts were canceled, which is to do this experiment under realistic flux conditions. And that requires cryogenic conditions. Then you're operating with as few photons per second kind of um, uh, flux levels. And our goal is to demonstrate this. And once we have demonstrated this, hopefully in three, four years time, we feel more comfortable that you can actually implement this. And then there's little things, detectors, you need to be looking at carefully. Maybe you can replace some of the optics with photonic chips. So, but, but demonstrating this measuring principle is I think one of the most important things for the time being. Uh, great talk, somewhat related uh, to the previous question, where would detector noise be on your plot in the challenges slide? for the best current infrared detector and where do you need to be? Yeah, that's, 
a very important question. We didn't put detectonoids on there because all the detectors we currently have are not good enough. So we're looking into uh, other technologies. Um, I just, uh, unfortunately, I missed uh, some colleagues at JPL yesterday who wanted to talk to me about uh, potential ways out of this. Um, kit detectors could be a very elegant way. So kinetic inductance detectors where you also would have energy resolution. Of course, these operate at very, very low temperatures. So this is something that would have to qualify for space. The current detectors for MIRI are probably not, not, not good enough. And it's our understanding that also MCT detectors do not cover the full wavelengths range and don't have the same noise properties. So this is certainly an area where we need to look into in some more detail, but with the current funding we have, we cannot start a production series of you know, space grade flight detectors. One more question. Hi, very interesting talk. Vincent Koff from NASA. What temperatures do you guys assume for the telescopes? 30 Kelvin for the mirrors, so passively cooled. Uh, and then probably the, the beam combiner has, be, has to be of order 15. And then the detector depends on the detector technology. But we would like to keep it passively cooled and not actively cool the mirrors. Right. Okay, thanks. Thank you.